Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Team House. This is episode 149. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. Our guest tonight is Bill Gage coming at us for a second round. Um, We were going to have Kim on tonight. He had life circumstances intervene, so we're going to have Kim on in August. Uh, Bill was awesome enough to jump in at the last minute. We really appreciate it. Um, We had Bill on our previous episode. Uh, You guys can go check out if you want. He served in the Secret Service and continues to serve in law enforcement today. Um, Thought that it's also very topical to have him on to talk about some of the things that are going on uh, in the country right now. I mean, we'll try not to be overly political, but I mean... Even just talking from a technical aspect, I mean, some of these subjects, school security, for instance, um, I think we can have an adult conversation about that's that'll be helpful. And Bill has no shortage of, of uh, wild Secret <laughs> Service and uh, and law enforcement stories, although we did establish that he was not down in Columbia for the party uh, on the last episode. <laughs> I have proof that I was not there. I have proof. You have an alibi. You have an alibi. I do have an alibi. (laughs) Fake news. Fake news. Again, was at the White House that day. But thanks for having me on again, guys. And again, I I said this in the intro, and I really mean you guys have had some real heroes on here, man. And I'm I'm humbled just to be like in the same scroll, like on the list of podcasts you guys have done for my name to pop up some of the guys you've had. So thanks for having me on. And Dave, Jack said – that you specifically wanted to talk about the Britney Spears wedding and the Amber Heard trial. So if you got, I'll, I'll wait to hear what you have to say about those things. Um, yeah, Britney Spears got married. Did she? I don't know. I didn't know this. And Amber Heard oh, had you a guys trial. Know this. I, I all she, I saw. All I saw was that she's been posting spicy pictures on Instagram. That's all I know about. Yeah, and really, yeah. and probably the only thing I care about. She got married, and husband number two crashed the wedding, caused the scene, and no ended up getting shit. arrested. Yeah. yeah, all all on video, of course. That's, yeah, that's gangster. That is gangster. So when they said, yeah, and, "If anybody has an objection, please state it now." Like that—that that was when like, I like, object. That was like the Mustang convertible came crashing through the front door. Yeah, yeah, and you know he's on summer break at Harvard, and he took time off of school. You know, I'm sure he's a real winner. I don't know anything about the guy. I only know these things because my wife keeps me up to date. Um, and she was glued to the Amber Heard trial. I, I don't know. I don't know why, but she was. So I got almost daily updates on the Amber Heard trial. So I only I only saw the memes with that. Um, yeah, I, I didn't watch. I didn't watch it either. Yeah, uh, I only saw the memes. I, and- all of my spicy content is is about military, weird military stuff. And and Britney Spears and Britney, and, Spears and Britney photos. spicy photos shows up on my timeline occasionally. Yes. Oh wow! Well, that's in the algorithm. So what are you looking at, Jack? If that's showing up in your algorithm, what are you looking at? I have an alibi. <laughs> <laughs> it's for work. He, it's he, for work. He was at the White House that day. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, let me talk well, about I, or one of our sponsors real quick. Yeah. Um, Boikies. Everybody uh, who's ever watched this before probably knows we love Boikies. Um, Bill, have you had uh, Biltong before? I have not. I've had Biltong, but I haven't had this brand. It is amazing. If you, if you folks out there, uh, guys, gals, if folks uh, love beef jerky, you're going to love Boikies Biltong even more. It's made in the USA. It's air-dried USDA beef. It doesn't have all the preservatives, all the sugar that uh, um, beef jerky often has. 32 grams of protein, zero grams of sugar. It's great for keto. I mean, it's delicious. It really is. And if you I'm like gonna, spicy, try their chili. But uh, it, it's I'm gonna pick some up. yeah. Are you guys sponsored by Smart Water now? I see Jack. Yeah. Some no, you guys can no. go to Team Ten for ten percent off your order. Team oh, 10. I'm sorry. No, that's all good. What is it? Team Ten. Team Ten for ten percent off your order at Boikies.com. That's B-O-I-K-E-Y-S.com. Team Ten for ten percent off. And Bill, we only wish we were sponsored by everybody that. We drank. Yeah, we've been trying to get sponsored by like a like Lafroy or a, a real Scotch company, um, and I'm I'm usually drinking Scotch, but I was out all day running around the city, and uh, I had a five hour energy drink before we did this show. Like, we'll, I, I, I'm, af- oh, I'm afraid I might not make it to the end of this show. Uh, <laughs> big mistake, man. Those things spike your whole energy level, and then you crash. 
<laughs> as long as I can, if I can hold on, if I can white knuckle this thing for an hour and a half to two hours, uh, we'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I was telling you guys, um, uh, Biden went on the Jimmy Kimmel show this week. I don't know if you saw that. And when his motorcade was passing through LA, there was a, a protester that rushed the motorcade and was tackled, um, by an agent and, uh, was posted all over the internet. I did not recognize him at first. Uh, and the, the morning after it happened, my phone, I was drinking coffee in the morning. My phone started blowing up with some secret service friends and contacts. And I, Told they was like, don't you recognize him? That's so and so, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, if you guys watch the video, uh, the Biden's motorcade, or, or I shouldn't say the motorcade, the motorcade. You know, you guys have ever seen a presidential motorcade? Some of these are 50, 60 cars long. Yeah. Um, and they use it in some, uh, not to get political. Republicans and Democrats are guilty of it, but they use the motorcade as like sometimes for fundraisers, they'll let like big donors ride in the motorcade so they can say they've ridden in the motorcade. I want to ride in the motorcade. Um, yeah, no shit. I want to ride in the motorcade. <laughs> staffers, local politicians. Um, uh, and you say you want to ride in it till you've been in one and it's like a slinky, all right? It's like running in formation. Um, Cause especially when you're at the back of the motorcade, at some points you're driving five or 10 miles an hour. Cause it's just so long. There's so many cars right. and a lot of them, there's no need for it, but Biden's limo and the spare limo had already passed. Uh, and in the video, you'll see the cat truck and then the hammer truck go by. And then she rushes the motorcade and is tackled by this agent. Um, and uh, the agent is, he struggles a little bit to get her into custody. She, like kind of knocks his hat off and he's having some trouble um, getting there in custody. I don't know if you guys have ever had to get somebody in custody before. It's not easy. That doesn't, it's not easy, especially, you know, you don't want to like pummel them. Right. Um, so in law enforcement, we teach this thing called pain compliance, um, but he wasn't using any pain compliance and he had some troubles getting her into custody. Um, the video cuts out, but uh, I totally recognize the guy and, I will tell you, he was a he was a team leader on Cat when I was there, and we did not get along, man. <laughs> it just and the thing is, I loved the guy. I thought he was a cool dude. He was funny. He had this amazing sense of humor. Um, he, he spoke fluent French, and he's a good dude. And I loved hanging out with him, but he just did not like me for some reason, man. Just did not like me. And um, I don't know if you guys ever had relationships with people where you. It was obviously they didn't like you and you try to make it work and it yeah. actually makes it worse by you trying to get them to like you. Yeah, my parents. And, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, most girls for me. It's mo mo most uh, girls' relationships have with girls. But anyway, we um, they we went on a trip together. Jeez, man, probably 2011. Um, he was a team leader and they threw a team together. It wasn't my normal platoon. Um, uh, the, the cat team I was on, it wasn't my normal platoon. They threw an ad hoc team together. And he was one of the team leaders and we went to Baghdad and then we jumped ahead to Athens with then Vice President Biden. And we're sitting on the, um, uh, the Secret Service, they call it a car plane, which is really like a C-17 with all the limos. I think I talked about that on the previous show. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll send you guys some photos sometimes or like I'm laying next to the president's limo, you know, on an air mattress flying in the air on the C-17. But we're sitting on the C-17 that Andrew was getting ready to take off and I'd forgotten a piece of gear. Um, do you guys remember the old night vision, the old J mounts that go on your, your helmet? I'd forgotten my freaking J mount, man. Not the end of the world, right? Not the end of the world. I could get a spare or borrow one from the midnighters, but it sent this uh, team leader into a spiral and he just would not leave me alone the rest of the trip. When we got to Baghdad, um, he just was like on my ass about everything. Um, at one point I, I went to the, um, cafeteria at the embassy. Um, we were, uh, hey, uh, I think I drew the, we drew the midnight shift in Baghdad and, uh, we went to the cafeteria then was like open all night, I think in Baghdad and you could get rippets and all this stuff. So we went oh, for like yeah. midnight rations, whatever. Yeah. And came back and he was inspecting my, my, my M4. And I was like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> he just was on my ass. And like I said, I loved this guy, man. I, I thought he was funny. He just had it out for me. And the whole trip on my ass, we get to Athens and, um, the way the secret service trips 
um, works sometimes, and it worked this time, is we leaped frog from Baghdad to Athens and we were down for like a day and a half because uh, Biden went to another city. So we were down for like a day and a half doing our walkthroughs and prepping for the visit. And so we were there prepping for the visit. We were doing the walkthrough of the hotel and he said something, we were, man, all the staff was there. Um, I think the ambassador might've been there. Uh, he said something to me. I said something back. He said something to me. I said something back and he, he grabbed me and I grabbed him and the fight was on. This is right outside the <laughs> VP's hotel suite, man. And they have to break us apart. And I don't know what got into me. I was just infuriated. And you ever been in a fight or see fights on TV or on the street where like people are, they're trying to like grab you and you're like trying to get away. And that was me. I was just trying to get away. I was so furious. And um, anyway, we, we had an uneasy piece. I think we later ended up taking a trip together, just him and me to Israel um, with former President Carter. And we kind of settled our differences in some way. But um, good dude, man. He just for some reason didn't like me. So. It's funny, isn't it? How like sometimes you really respect a person professionally but don't like them personally or vice versa. Sometimes you really like the guy personally, but not professionally. Uh, no, it's, it, it's, it's true. It, it's interesting how that works. And sometimes it can be really difficult to, to manage that, particularly if it's a superior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was a senior guy to me, man, spoke fluent French and um, uh, he had been an army officer, I think. Oh, he that might explains have actually gone it. To West Point. That explains so much. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But anyway, when I saw when, when I went back and watched the video, once my friends were texting me like, "Holy crap, that's so and so," um, I got a little kick out of that. So, so, so what? I can't what, you guys can see it. what? What? What happened exactly at, at the motorcade? This uh, this protester like tried to charge President Biden's uh, vehicle or something like yeah, this? Yeah, I tried, tried to charge the motorcade, and um, so just moving on from the inside baseball there of like this personality conflict. So, uh, my 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 security. Uh, sort of analysis is that the local police uh, got caught looking at the motorcade. All right. So when you do your, when you're on an advanced team and you're responsible for securing the motorcade route, you always tell the local cops, don't look at the motorcade when it passes by your, your post or your position. Cause that's like the most dangerous time. Right. And it looked like to me that the local police got caught looking at the motorcade and she was able to get through the barricades and charge the uh, the motorcade or, or charge the the limo, but pretty dumb protester. He had already driven by. And, you know, one of the things they tell you in, in motorcade ops, especially protection ops, like you just keep driving. You're not going to stop for that. You're just going to keep driving. Excuse me. So the motorcade had already passed, and I think she was protesting the environment or abor or abortion. I, I can't remember. Um, I. I uh, I don't know that she was carrying a sign, but no like threat level per se, because she wasn't carrying explosives or a firearm. And the, the limo's a tank anyway, man. That thing can withstand um, just about anything, um, especially, you know, something that a human could carry, you know, even like some sort of like, you know, human born IED or something, a backpack bomb or whatever, it could withstand most of that. Um, so there was no danger to him. But yeah, she was trying to, uh, I don't know what her goal was, maybe just to embarrass him or get the motorcade to stop, maybe, which it and ain't going to stop. Your buddy there just kind of like did the flying squirrel into her is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. He actually came across from the other side of the street. <laughs> um, sort of a and, flying elbow kind of thing. The people's no, elbow. He, yeah, they, the they people's elbow. Little, the taxpayers paid for tussle. it. They get in this little tussle, and then um, he just grabs around the waist and actually body slams her. And then the fight was on kind of on the ground and uh, they're going at it. I, I am a cop man. So I feel like I can critique other cops. I don't know. Nobody else helped him. Uh, he was by himself fighting this girl. The other cops are just kind of standing around watching, which in some respects they tell you, um, right. That, um, be careful of distractions. Um, uh, when you're when you're doing protection, because that's how w w the plot for Malcolm X. That's how Malcolm X was killed. Was they created a distraction? His security team got in on the distraction, and then he was uh, assassinated. 
so they always tell you, you know, don't, don't get distracted. If somebody's dealing with something, you, you maintain your post. I don't know if that's what the police were thinking, but nobody helped. Um, uh, I almost said his name. I'm not going to do it. Um, helped him when he was uh, struggling, trying to get her into custody. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, for people who haven't actually tried to, like, detain somebody who is resisting, it's, it, it is... It's almost, I mean, it, I'm not going to say it's, it's almost impossible, but it is very hard for one person to do that without using, using the minimal force, without yeah. using a lot, a lot of force. Like it is very, very hard to put handcuffs or, or flex cuffs or anything else on a person. If you don't have somebody else, holding I, uh, them. I worked on a story a while back about a group of, um, private security contractors, mercenaries, call them what you will, waging, they did a sting operation in Thailand on a guy, a Taiwanese guy who's running a PPE scam. So they, they were running this sting to kind of like uh, jam this guy up. And uh, some of it, it's on video actually, they confronted him in a restaurant. And let me tell you, an overweight 60 year old Taiwanese guy put up a hell of a fight that yeah. you might not have expected Yeah, <laughs> yeah. when it came yeah. down to it. I've had to do it many times, man, elderly people, kids, um, and you're, you're trying to use the minimal amount of force necessary right, to get them right. into custody, and you, you just can't start pummeling them in the face uh, right. for no reason. Right. Um, I just was in a fight three weeks, a month ago. It was me and another officer. We got locked into an apartment with like some family members, and the fight was on, and he was struggling. He was a, He's a bigger guy, and he couldn't control – like a hundred pound girl. Cause she was just putting up so much of a fight. Yeah. No, it's, it's tough. Like if you haven't ha tried to do that or had to do that or have somebody like act actively resist you, it just in training or whatever, like it's, it's, tough, yeah. it's very tough. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. What was, uh, go ahead, yeah. Dave. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I, I wanted to ask Jack about his article. You said you wrote an article this week about school security. Yeah. Yeah. So Geez, um, let me, I'll pull it up real quick, just if people are interested in finding it. But uh, yeah, so the question that um, Lindsey Graham had brought up and publicly said that we have uh, all of these military veterans in America, trained veterans, and in the aftermath of the, the most recent, you know, horrible school shooting, he was saying, well, we should be able to use these guys for school security. And so I wrote an article for uh, ConnectingVets.com. It's titled uh, Armed Veterans in Schools for Added Security Focuses on the Wrong Issue, Special Ops Vets Say. And so I talked to um, Jeff Miller, who has been on this show a couple times. He's a Special Forces veteran. And Eric Dorenbush, who uh, served in an Army Special Mission Unit, about this very issue. And both of them kind of felt that this issue of, like, should we put veterans like armed veterans and use them as security guards? It's kind of the wrong question or, or, or maybe the wrong answer to the wrong question. Right. And that we shouldn't even be having this kind of conversation about like taking some guy who served in the infantry for a few years, giving him a gun and have him wander the school campus. Like that's not really going to help anything. Um, so they, they both kind of came at the, at the subject from different perspectives. Um, Eric has some criticisms about how police officers are trained uh, Jeff has some uh, issues with, uh, you know, he, his point was that we should treat it as a physical security issue, um, creating a single access point into the school. Uh, that is a question of access and egress. Uh, obviously, you're going to have fire escapes, but there should be a single control point um, for students or, or anybody coming into the school. And then that's where you place the armed security guard. Um, so it's a question of redesigning schools on one hand and then putting the right person at the right place um, at that access point. And that, that was Jeff's perspective. And I think that's – I'd like to hear your thoughts, Bill. But I think that's um, – a lot of people don't like to hear the, you know, let's improve school security. They see that as kind of a dodge from what they see as the larger issue of gun control. I see it kind of the other way around that gun control runs up against these constitutional issues – we have the same big argument pro pro and, and against every single time this happens. And then what ends up happening is nothing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the physical security issue, we can address that without talking about gun control and running up against constitutional issues. Um, I would much rather have that conversation that can lead to some tangible differences in schools nationwide that 
I, I really believe could save lives and, and absolutely would save lives um, as opposed to what we've been doing, which is fucking nothing, frankly. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please start, um, start wherever. So, okay, so um, the, the schools have got to be secured. I mean, there should be no argument there, right, that uh, single point access, access control, uh, like my, my, my daughter's school and my son's school totally locked, you know, during the school day, you have a, a video doorbell, you have to ring, you have to show your ID to the video to actually gain access to the school. Um, and, uh, there's sort of like, they check it again when you come in, uh, not only that it's like multi-layered security, right? So just to get into that outer perimeter door, you have to show access. And then once you step in, it's not like you have unfiltered access. Like, again, there's a, 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 another secretary there behind glass and um, it appears bullet resistant. I haven't asked, but again, it's a, it's a separate, you have to go through another access point that's also controlled by that secretary that buzzes you in to open the door. So without a doubt, um, that is one of, the, excuse me, one of the aspects that should be looked at is the school security as far as the access points. Um, I'm a big believer in the school resource officer program. A lot of people, I, I think the prison, the pipeline argument um, has been way overblown. Have there been like fourth graders charged with assault and somewhere in the country? Of course there are, and there have been, and those are terrible cases and they should be looked at individually, whether that was appropriate or not. But overall, the school resource officer program, in my experience, super beneficial, has a lot of different aspects to it, not just for security purposes, but you know, say Johnny has a bag of weed in his locker, the teacher finds it. Well, the school resource officer knows, hey, Johnny's a straight A student. He's on the football team. He's never been in trouble a day in his life. He made a bad decision. Well, the officer decides, you know what? I'm just gonna throw the marijuana in the trash and not charge him and call his parents and let them deal with it. Um, so there, rather, as opposed to, if there's no school resource officer, you just, you call 911 and a patrolman shows up who, who doesn't know this kid, doesn't know anything. All he knows is there was weed in the school and charges him. So the diversion aspect of the school resource officer is um, immeasurable and I, I think very important uh, besides the, the security aspect. But, you know, having trained school resource officers in every school, I think, is the way to go. Um, when I was doing a lot of consulting, Jack, um, I would run into this all the time with these even Fortune 500 companies that would hire a guy who with a, you know, Ohio 29th reserve battalion who did six months in, in Iraq. And now he's a security expert, you know, and um, he was like a, a PFC rifleman and, you know, he did a, a combat tour and now he's a security expert. And there's a lot of things that go in, man, to securing facilities. Um, there, there's a lot of different um, aspects to it. So, just like you said, ha having a guy who was a rifleman and now give him a gun standing outside of school. And before we went on camera, I was talking to you guys about the new use of force laws in Virginia. And if you just give a guy a gun and you're like, okay, you're now responsible for ser school security and you don't give them any training on use of force legalities, you know, proper use of force. When can you use your firearm? Um, and are you just going to give them firearms, right? Are they just going to have lethal force? Are you going to give them tasers, pepper spray? Um, you know, what if it's somebody who shows up to the school um, who who's not armed that's trying to get access and they only have a firearm? Are they now going to shoot this person? Um, so they're, the, I don't think that's the answer either. And, you know, a, a, an aside, I think you and I have emailed once or twice before, Jack, and it drives me mad. I think you call it the operator aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, um, I see it all the time, man. Guys that like, you know. Want to play tactical Either dress way. up? Oh my God, man! You know when I go to um, one of the gun ranges here, or even th there's a very famous store here and near that that I live near called Green Top, Green Top Sporting Goods, and it's a mom and pop um, sporting goods store. It's massive, and they're line out the door, man, before they ever open. You know, people waiting to get in. It's a really cool store, and the owners are awesome. They do a lot for the community. It's a really great store, but. Um, I go in there sometimes to either buy ammo or something to go shoot at the range and guys are in there, man, with dump pouches, you know, on their gun belt and they got like everything perfect. They got like cry pants and I'm like, what are you doing, man? And 
my point in saying that is that's not the guys you want yeah. doing school security. And, you know, I don't want to get political here. I think we talked in the opening, Jack and, and Dave, about not getting political. But um, is there really a need for like a 19 year old kid to have 30 round magazines? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure you guys have been to a range before. I've been to a range many times to shoot and to, to brush up on my firearm skills. And the guy next to me, you know, some 19 year old kid has an M4 with all these 30 round mags and he's shooting a target at like the five yard line and he's just emptying mag after mag after mag. After. I'm like, what are you doing? What are, is that sports shooting? Like, I don't even know what that is. So, you know, I don't want to get into a gun control debate cause I am a supporter of the second amendment, but is there really a need to have a 30 round mag? It, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a really nuanced, I mean, obviously when you, when you say it like that, you're right. And you are also, a, um, a support of this, like it becomes a very nuanced issue. And I think there are intelligent discussions that can be had about it, but unfortunately sort of in our political environment, those aren't, those are never the discussions that are had. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I say this, go ahead, Jack. I don't mean to interrupt. Oh, I, I was just going to add, I, I think there's also a conversation to be had about stronger background checks and the, you, you do, this is a, the, the, the conversation for and against is very legitimate. There are legitimate arguments there against it as well about how do we keep the guns out of people who are, let's, let's just be polite saying having a mental health crisis, right? How do we stop crazy people from attaining weapons? Um, but okay. How do, how do you legislate that? And how do you do that without, uh, while ensuring that people aren't stripped of their civil rights without some sort of due process taking place? And I, I don't pretend to have the answers to those yeah, questions. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, and I don't either. I, I will say a caveat. I say this all the time, man. We put men on the fucking moon with some duct tape and aluminum foil, <laughs> and we can't figure this out. As yeah. I mean, it's true, man. We, we've done amazing things in this country. I can find out every piece of information ever created in the history of man on this iPhone, and we can't come together and figure this out. Um, so specifically on your point about mental health, Jack, it gets confusing, right? Because say I'm in a tumultuous relationship with my wife mm -hmm. and um, which I'm not, I'm in love with my wife pictures over here behind me. But um, <laughs> if I'm in a tumultuous relationship with my wife, we're on the, we're on the outs and she decides to fuck me and she calls the cops and says, Oh, he says he's going to go shoot up a school. He's going to kill himself. The cops only have her side. They, they show up, they take me into custody and, and say, I'm a, a lawful gun owner. What is my recourse right. to right, what is my due process to say, wait yeah. a sec, that is not true. Right. Um, or, you know, say when I was 15, my girlfriend breaks up with me and I told my parents I wanted to commit suicide because I was so distraught over this relationship. I go to counseling. I realize like, you know, it was a one time thing. It was a youthful sort of hormonal thing. I get mental health treatment and I, I live to be an adult and I'm fine. And I turn 30 and I decide I, I want to, you know, buy a Glock for home protection. Should I be prohibited from that? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are that it gets complicated, but yeah. again, we can figure this out as a country, man. And I, I think some of the people that are the biggest second amendment supporters or the operator aesthetics, man, you see it all the time. And I'm like, guys, you're not, and I've had this argument with my sister because she, want, she wants us to be like Australia, right? Like you have to turn in your gun, outlaw guns, no guns. And I'm like, what if you're a rancher in Wyoming? And some of these ranches, you could be 30 miles from your ranch house. I mean, yeah. these are massive ranches. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should be able to have a 30 round mag and a, you know, if you live on a ranch in Wyoming. Um, but if you're some suburban kid who plays Xbox all day and, you know, is a barista at Starbucks or something, do you really need a 30 round magazine? I would argue no. And, you know, I, I, I think we need to find a way to come together to figure that out. I mean, whether it's state by state, um, you know, the mental health thing is going to be difficult, too, mm -hmm. because there has to be that. I think that needs to be decided by a judge where you have due process. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the other, I think one of the other challenges with that is like we see in a number of these cases, especially the large shootings, 
the the school shootings and whatnot. Like we see that, like uh, the kid down in Florida, like the, the cops have been called on him numerous times. You know, students had said, yeah, we think he's going to, you know, do something bad. And yeah, and it gets ignored. Well, and there's I mean, a big he, he was he wasn't Go convicted. Ahead, he wasn't convicted of anything. Right. So, like, what could the police do? And I understand, like, the people, uh, the frustration of the public. Like, you knew there was something wrong with this dude, but legally, I mean, what did you expect the cops to do? Like, did this guy? Break yeah, up? yeah. Mental health is a civil process. It's not a criminal process. And I deal with mental health every single day. I'm at work, sometimes multiple days. And it's, it's not a criminal issue. There are people out there that have serious mental health issues. It's not their fault. You know, they don't choose to be mentally ill. And we need to get them to the help, whether that's medication, uh, seeing a, a psychologist or psychiatrist. However, there's been a big push in psychology and psychiatry in the past 30, you know, 40 years to deinstitutionalize people mm -hmm. and let them live a free life at home and it sucks, man. I'm sorry, but there are some people that really should be in an institution. It's not their fault. Um, they just don't, we, we can't allow them to live in a free society. And those are hard questions that, you know, we, we need to look at, but you know, you're exactly right, Jack. And I was going to get into this a little bit, uh, with your talking to you about your article, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Secret Service man was at the forefront of this long before it was sexy, okay? Uh, the National Threat Assessment Center, the NTAC, the Secret Service, developed this in the in the late 90s. They came up with this profile of a, of a, of a, of a school shooter back in 2003. You guys could remember back in the dark ages in 2003. Um, and they came up and, and basically that, that prototype, that profile of that shooter it's the same in every single one of these, man. You can plug and play Virginia Tech, Parkland, Aurora, um, um, the what was it in Texas? Uribe? Am I pronouncing that right? I believe so. Uvalde. Yeah. Oh, what did you say? It was uh, Uvalde. 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 Sorry, Uvalde. Those are plug and play, man. It's all the same. It's somebody with a diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health condition, some perceived grievance on on um, either a family member or somebody at, at the place. So we, we know what, what, um, what these shooters look like, what their background is, what they're suffering from, and why we can't figure that out, I, I don't know. And I, I think right now you have extremes on both sides, right? You have people from the Second Amendment are like, don't take my guns. And you have the other side that's like, oh, it's not about mental health. It's not about school security. It's about the guns. Right. Somewhere in the middle, man, is where, where it's at. That's, well, that's where my frustration I, is. And but. I think that that plays into Jack's point earlier, yeah. too, is that, you know, a lot of people are going to disagree with you about, you know, about a 19 year old and 30 round mags. Right. They're going to say it's their Second Amendment. Right. And and yet where we live in New York, like we can't have 19 round, or we can't have 30 round. Mag, we can't even have we can't have AR. <laughs> right. So that is. So it's, you know, um, but, but where that discussion may not go anywhere for a while, because everybody is going to have their own very specific interpretations of that. Like we can look at something like school security that, that isn't as nuanced as mental health. It's not as nuanced as, as gun control or, or the second amendment. It's something that at a base level, everybody should be able to agree on that like what the schools that your kids go to single point of entry, you know, it, that it, well, it's, layered security. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the bare minimum, right? People lock the doors of their own houses at night. Why don't they want to lock the doors of the schools where their kids are during the day? I know. Um, I know I upset people, especially here in New York City, when I when I bring this up. But I mean, these constant calls to like ban the AR-15, it, it's just a counterproductive conversation that goes nowhere from my point of view. You can ban that rifle. Go ahead. And, if, if you did, you ban it. They'll just use another semi-automatic rifle. All right, we're going to ban semi-automatic rifles. They start using semi-automatic pistols. I mean, it, it, it goes it goes down and down and this notion that you're going to be able to ban guns in America, like we're not European, we're not Australian, like <laughs> guns are a fundamental part of American culture, love it or hate it. It's in our constitution. Anyone who's ever been out to the shot show in Las Vegas, you instantly see 
<laughs> how ingrained it is in American society. There's more guns in this country than there are people. And that's just, it's not going to change. Like, we're not going to become, you know, the UK. Um, that's not going right. to happen. And I think the answer is just keeping the guns out of people that shouldn't have them. And then, you know, we, we, we figure out as a country, like, what is an acceptable... I mean, the the the, uh, the 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 Clinton uh, crime control bill. I don't know if the it was assault called the weapons crime ban. Bill. Yeah, the assault weapons ban um, limited what was it? Twenty rounds. Oh, I can't remember the stipulations, but there were magazine limitations and pistol grip limitations and stock and all kinds I of think silly that's shit. Perfectly acceptable. You know, listen, I'm in law enforcement, man. I've been most of my adult life, um, and I don't run around unless I'm at work with a 30 round magazine, like I just don't do it. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm frequently armed, almost always off duty. And I always say this, and especially I, when I'm teaching younger police officers, I tell them, listen, I'm not getting involved in anything off duty unless it's threat condition midnight, man. Like, you know, like something is going on that my life is threatened. Other than that, I'm going to be a great witness. You know, if there's an active shooter or something, I, I'm, I, I'll take action. But anything else, I'm just going to retreat and be a great witness, man. I'm not going to get involved in anything. I'm going to let the uniform police respond. And, and I'm a police officer. So, you know, the, why you need a 30-round mag, um, I just don't get it. Or why, you know, you want an M4 because it's cool, man. You want to go shoot at a range, I, I guess. I, I just, um, I only know cops. That's all I've ever known most of my adult life. So I don't know what it's like to, you know, just go shoot an M4 for, for fun. You know, I, I don't know what that's like, but do you need it? Is it that much fun for sports shooting? I don't know. I mean, both you guys have been in the military, so you, you know, I, I mean, do you have friends that aren't I, in law enforcement that just go shoot for fun. I, I do. Um, you know, I, I personally don't, I mean, if I live someplace, you know, where, where that were possible, maybe I would, I'm not sure. Um, but again, it's one of those things. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of like, the war on drugs and prohibition and, and everything else like that. It's like, we can, we can legislate whatever we want, but you know, how, I don't know how, how, if, is it really going to stop how the, the lunatic from you know, going or, or into, do we just start criminalizing more yeah. things? I, I, I don't know. Right, like right. I said, I, I, I don't have, I don't come down hard on, on this. I mean, I also support the second amendment, and, you know, I mean, sort of according to the Second Amendment, people should be able to have howitzers, right? Or, or like, I don't know where the line is. I don't. Um, right. But I also don't want to tell people that think that they should have a 30 round magazine that they, you know, that they should. I, I like, I just don't know. I don't know what the answer and I is. I probably, I don't want to backpedal, Dave, but I probably, like, I just have such an aversion to the operator aesthetic, man. It drives me so furious when yeah. I see it. And it might influence my opinion. My hatred of that might influence my opinion on gun control. So and I, I, I probably I, should rethink it. I'm probably going to say something this time that will uh, upset the uh, the Second Amendment crowd. But I, I think that you're a little bit onto something there, Bill, that those types, that there's a certain type of person, a certain type of Second Amendment supporter who gives gun owners in general a bad name and makes them Absolutely. look makes them look like they're lunatics and you can see that they're ranting online that they're unable to have adult <laughs> conversations about I mean it's like hey you support the second amendment that's cool articulate your point you know have, that, have try to try to convince people try to be persuasive make a persuasive argument to these lefties that want to ban guns um because I mean, just like ranting and raving is is just making yourself look like a lunatic. Like, please, please stop. Right. You're making yourself yeah. look like idiots. It's tough because you can't just say "but my guns," right? Because right. again, if we take the Second Amendment to the to its logical conclusion, there shouldn't be a ban on any, like on any type of weaponry or or, or right. Right. I, I mean, almost and. But it it also doesn't help like the progressives or the liberals or whomever else when when they don't when they don't even understand weapons at, oh, a, yeah. at a basic function and you know call you know when you have them like 
creating new segments with you know some former army guy going i'm going full semi-automatic right now that like was, that was a like, that was a general like you're you're not going to win anybody over with a conversation if you can't have a conversation about yeah right i i i said the same thing like this week or last week where it was like why can the press not do like basic fact checking around weapons and how weapons function there is no shortage there is no shortage of experts of firearms experts in right. this country right. uh that you can call up uh, people who know way more about it than i do uh and, and do some very basic fact checking and yeah that fails to happen um so often and you know a lot some people will say well it doesn't matter you know that's not important you know banning the guns is what's or whatever the, their argument is but it's like no if the facts the very the basic facts of the article and of the reporting are wrong it discredits all of the reporting the entire um, yeah it, 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 that's right that's i'm not a reporter you are jack but it does discredit the whole the whole report and i Totally agree with you guys. I have heard the term AR-15 on every single news report for weeks now. It's AR-15, AR-15, AR-15. And some of the experts they've had on um, some of these news programs, you know, I, I saw one where they, they had this guy who was a firearms expert and, you know, no law enforcement background, no military background. He just had like the highest level of NRA training. And I'm not here to, um, I'm not like talking about it, but the NRA, but, you know, here this guy's talking about what it's like to draw his weapon on somebody. And, you know, he may know like academic knowledge of firearms, but to speak on actually like use of force encounters or deadly force encounters or what kind of firearm you might need. Um, I don't know that this guy was qualified. I, I think a lot of times the military just, or sorry, the media grabs right. anybody yeah. to put him in front of the camera. And so, um, I did want to move on and talk about the police response in Uvalde because I yeah, think that's yeah, been really controversial. Me too. Yeah. Um, like, I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah, about – um, I mean, I don't know if you have any insider baseball on that. There's but. there's an investigation ongoing, of course, but I, I, I want to hear your thoughts, Bill, and I, I think I, I'm interested in active shooter protocols and SOPs. Um, and whether, whether or not they were followed in, in, in this instance. Absolutely. Do you guys need a sponsor break? You want me to, to go – I think we're are, are we, no, we're we're good, Bill. We're good. <laughs> okay, all right, man. Um, yeah. So, um, as I mentioned before, we went live, Jack. You guys mind? I'm going to open up no, another please. beer, man. Yeah, go ahead. I haven't had a beer in like nine days, so. Um, it's all, yeah, the so team it's been all, right it's all been it's been all Jameson since then. No, I, I had a bad experience <laughs> about nine days ago, which um, was some beer which means i had way too much of it with a friend and i swore <laughs> off alcohol during my 3 a.m hangover um so i'm i'm back i'm we're, back in the game baby but um we're glad yeah, we can so be that I, bad influence for you yes yes i'll blame you so my wife yells at me when i'm tipsy after the podcast i'll, I'll say it was dave's fault um yeah so uh as i was mentioned before we went live jack there Texas State University has been at the forefront of this. They have been for several years. They have a program called Alert, and the Alert program has been phenomenal. It's revolutionized, changed law enforcement. Uh, the original doctor, academic doctor that came up with that has since retired. They have a new guy uh, over at Texas State, but um, it revolutionized law enforcement, and it was the response, how law enforcement treats the response. Everybody knows before Columbine, it was like, isolate, contain, and call, you know, additional resources. And now it's go to the threat, um, you know, address the threat, sort of the fine fix, um, finish kind of deal. Um, uh, alert is kind of actually, there's actually an additional um, next step that's kind of slowly catching on around the country called Rescue Task Force, where after the threat is knocked down, you know, the active shooter is, is neutralized. Now you have the follow on where you've got to now come in and clear the building or the structure and you're going to have embedded fire rescue personnel and there's a whole ic or incident command component to that of the rescue task force so the rescue task force builds on alert but back to alert for a second the alert system or program or protocols essentially was the first responding officers go to the threat they neutralize the threat and the alert system was basically a collection of tactics that are interchangeable between officers, agencies, whether it's local, federal. Um, if I respond to something from a, 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 with an officer from another agency who I've never met, I've never talked to that person, we're gonna use the same tactics 
a, a lot of officers, I shouldn't say a lot, some officers, especially those with a tactical background, really have a lot of heartache with the alert tactics. Um, I've been to several alert schools. I'm a alert certified active shooter instructor. I, I teach active shooter quite frequently. I've done active shooter consulting for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I, I have some stories that I wanted to bring up for this when we, a little bit later. But uh, I don't know if you guys remember from your your Ranger days and even the Green Beret days, Jack. But you know, alert has a very simple CQB tactic: the two in, two over. Your uh, threshold clearing. If you guys know what that what I'm talking about, it's the threshold clearing, two in, two over. You clear the room. Uh, there's formations moving down the hallway. It's it's a very choreographed methodical way to clear a structure so um when i saw the uvalde incident unfold and as it's come out first of all the press conference was one of the worst i've seen that one press conference with the dps superintendent um where the press was just screaming questions i don't want to say that pio should be fired but it was a terrible press conference like you need to call on reporters. There needs to be a structure to that press conference. But anyway, um, I'm a police officer and I don't mean to personally attack that police chief. Um, but when I saw the news and it was unfolding, what I think happened here is I, I think he was undertrained and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I have been on scenes. I've not been on an active shooter scene like that at a school. Um, I've been on dozens where it was false alarms, where someone saw a guy in black with a machine gun and we had to go in and clear. Um, I've been on dozens of scenes where there's been multiple people shot and the gunman's still there or still at large. And what I'm here to tell you is the person in charge of that scene, the volume of information is like a deluge, avalanche of information overwhelming that incident commander. All right. Um, and sometimes it might just be a regular officer. A lot of times it's a first line supervisor, like a sergeant. Um, and that level of information is it's so overwhelming. And if you've never been in that situation before, you might not be able to process that information. And so what I think happened is that police chief was overwhelmed and was dealing with something that he might not have been capable of dealing with. This is not a personal attack on him. He's a public servant. It looks like he's probably served his community for years and he should be, you know, um, not rewarded, but uh, you know, we, we should recognize him for that. But I think in that situation, I think he was overwhelmed by the incident. Um, it's a small, small town, small police department. And I think he probably, that was the most critical incident he'd ever been involved in or even mm -hmm. close to it. Mm -hmm. And I think there was just, I have been on situations I'm, I'm telling you where, the information a lot of it's wrong right mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that people are screaming at you and the information that you're getting is wrong but i've seen incident commanders almost have a meltdown trying to process this information i've, I, I've seen guys who are normally calm start just screaming expletives because they can't fucking figure it out and um i think you have something to say I, 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 like you I, want to say. I think uh it came out today or yesterday where the chief of police said i didn't know who was in charge at the incident site and i didn't know it was me oh that, wow i did not see that see wow that, that that's the thing is that there have been so many stories that have come out right and i don't think he was on scene and there were there were stories and i don't know if these are true but there were stories that he had told them not to enter and it wasn't until border patrol and marshal showed up. And I think the border patrol guys were like, fuck this, we're going in. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, and every time the police department has spoken, it's gotten worse. It's, it's changed. It's not right? Bad. It's not good. Yeah. It's yeah. not good. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. So go ahead. Dave. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, one of the things is that when you talk about a police department in some small town that has, how many ever people they have, you know, I mean, have they ever really done a, like a, a like a, a, an event or a, a drill that, yeah, where, they had. where they have to do, they did have they a, have? They have a SWAT team. Mm -hmm. Oh, did they, they yeah. had a SWAT team? So, you know, yeah. yeah. So were they a SWAT team on site? I don't know who was on site. I, yeah. mean, I, I believe they yeah. did. That's a good word, Dave, to use the word event. I mean, it doesn't have to be an active shooter. I mean, have they been on a, 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 
a homicide, a shooting, a double homicide? Have they been on a, a really critical incident before and having to manage that? And, you know, I'm lucky I, I work in a department, you know, it's a very violent area where I work. We have critical incidents almost every day. Uh, and a lot of the, the ICs, the incident commanders are fucking legit, man. They've dealt with this before. They know how to manage these incidents and can and, um, get it taken care of and problem solve. But, you know, if you've never been thrust into that situation before and yeah. been in the pilot seat, it's tough. And listen, a training environment's okay, but and, until it's a real world, right? you know, and, you know, just a quick story, man. Um, several years ago, I was, uh, we got called to a scene to actually a, a tire store and for reports of an active shooter. And we showed up. And there were uh, four people shot. Somebody had been bashed over the head with a tire iron. And there was a guy with a gun on scene. Essentially what had happened was a guy had gotten high on meth, had walked into this store and started shooting. Well, a couple of the guys that, um, well, the owner and a couple of the guys that uh, tire installers were all pro second amendment guys. And they are no, no shit. I, they are carrying while they're like putting tires on cars up on the lifts. They're carrying guns. So they got in a shootout in this tire store and it was right next to a sheets gas station. And so anyway, the point is, you know, we get dispatched to an active shooter and we roll up. We don't know who's who. Um, there's a couple people shot and we're trying to sort this situation out. We had been there maybe a minute. Um, people are screaming that he's the shooter. We're, you know, we're getting him into custody. We're trying to figure out what's going on. My sergeant at the time, uh, this guy, CM, I, I, I love him. I don't know if he's listening. He's one of the best supervisors i ever had. He's, when I talk about deluge of information, right? Like, I mean, it is volumes of information instantaneously he's trying to process. And a captain was on his way home, heard the call and rolled up, gets his whiteboard out of his police cruiser, like a, a whiteboard, this is a minute into this thing, man, and start screaming at CM, who's who's the sergeant. Stop everything. Don't do anything. I, start drawing on this whiteboard. I want all the assets you have here. I want a where is fire rescue, um, how many people shot. And I remember CM telling this guy, like, I don't fucking know, man. Just put your whiteboard away. Like, we are trying to figure this out. Right. And so you have two sides of the coin there, right? Like, so that captain was trying to do paralysis by analysis. And the sergeant saying like, bro, we've been here 30 seconds, man. Right. I, I don't, I have nothing for you. So I think down in Uvalde, I think there was so much information to process. And I think he was just overwhelmed. Now, whether I, this is my personal opinion. I don't think that's criminal. I don't think you can fault the guy for that. That just was, you know, the wrong guy for the situation. I don't think that's criminal, man. I don't think he should be. And I think the DOJ is investigating, right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Well, the question I have, because I don't know what, um, if there are federal guidelines for active shooter, especially in the school or whatever, or, or if they're all local. But first, well, first off, how can, how, how can somebody be an incident lead you know commander or or you know the leader if like they should be informed of what's going on but if they're not on scene they shouldn't be making decisions and oh what, and that's right and and what's the policy especially when you do have an active shooter and especially in a place like a school does the first police car that roll up should they go in do they wait for more like how long do you wait how like when when time is that critical what's the policy because an incident commander sort of implies that there is a task force to be commanded, right? But in a situation right. like that, when when police are just rolling up as quick as they can get there, like what what's the what's the thought on that? So the so the incident the incident command process, the IC process, and I'm really getting in the weeds here, guys. Like that is a, a thing developed by FEMA. Believe it or not, uh, IC stuff was not developed as a result of an active shooter. It all came out of September 11th and the response to the Pentagon. Right. Because there's so many agencies, fire agencies responding to that. And one of the after actions that came out of the Pentagon was you have di different fire and rescue units doing their own thing. 
And so that was developed by the Alexandria Fire, De or sorry, the Arlington Fire Department developed the incident command procedures. And there's a whole, there's different levels of classes you can go to. And it's pretty standard throughout the whole country, the IC system. You guys can Google it. There's like level one, level two. I think I'm level two maybe, which is like the super basic. But um, uh, essentially, it doesn't matter, Dave. According to the IC principles that every local agency has adopted in the entire country, um, if I show up, Bill Gage can take command of a scene until I'm relieved by somebody. So it doesn't matter. Rank doesn't matter in the incident command. It's more um, locality based. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say where I work, but where I work, if there's a, a major incident and I'm one of the first officers there, I, I can take command until I'm relieved by somebody senior. So I'd heard that in Uvalde, it was a multi-agency response. And so Uvalde, whoever from Uvalde should have said, I have command. And that's actually, it's super cheesy. Uh, but per the FEMA guidelines, the incident command, you're supposed to say that on the radio, actually, I have command. You're supposed to say your unit number, where you're from, and I have command. It lets everybody know what's going on. But so, but in, in a situation, cause it became multi-agency, like, I think like after about 40 minutes, because the border patrol teams and the marshals like had to, like, they had to like drive in from like 70 miles away. I, I, wasn't it like, I think, but I mean, if, if, a if a cop shows up to a school shooting, do what's the policy? Do yeah, they go I, I in? Mean, I've seen SOPs at police departments that explicitly say the first responders, the first police officers, even if it's just one cop goes through the door by themselves. Yeah, no. And, and my agency has that in, in their general orders, the directives that, um, you will go, you will enter in and attempt to neutralize the threat. Um, so when I teach active shooter, this is, and you know, this is what I tell people, especially young police officers, when you go in there, this is what you're banking on, right? That your, your uh, tactics, your marksmanship and your mindset. All right. Those three things are better than the bad guys, tactics, marksmanship, and mindset. You're hoping that you've been trained better you're hoping that your mindset is a combat mindset where you're like, I'm going to fucking get this guy. Um, and the third thing is your marksmanship. You're hoping that, you know, this guy, you know, doesn't practice side alignment, side picture and right. trigger squeeze and all that. Right. So you're, you're banking on those three things. Each of those is 33 and a third. That last percent is luck, man. If it's your day, there's nothing you can do about it. If, right. if it's your day to go, um, there's nothing you can do about it. So yeah, you've got to enter in to save lives. And that's, um, pretty universal around the country. Actually, that's what alert teaches. Um, that that's pretty universal. I would say most agencies have that. There was an interesting lawsuit that came out of the Vegas shooting. Do you guys remember that nut yeah. job that shot from the hotel? Right. So yeah. there was a police officer in Vegas who was a couple floors below in a stairwell hearing the shooting happening above him. And he eventually, during sort of the follow-on investigations, he resigned, or sorry, he was fired. And he said that he was, and it sounded like, based, I read the deposition, it sounded legit. He said he was paralyzed by fear. He could not advance any further. And so, you know, I, I don't know what to tell people, you know, if somebody says, I was afraid to go in, do we fault those people? Yeah. Um, listen, I'm afraid every fucking day I go, man, I work in a very violent jurisdiction. You know, there's a lot of guns out there, but you've got to put your fear aside. And I'm talking to two combat veterans here, but I'm just talking from the law enforcement side. Like you've got to put your fear aside, um, and accomplish the mission. But at the same time, do, do we want to hold people criminally liable who are like paralyzed with fear? At a certain point when it's an entire police department, you got to wonder, I mean, I, I would be scared. I have, uh, and I don't fault anybody at all for being scared to go into that situation. But at the same time, can I just stand outside of school while some guy runs around in there and shoots kids? Like I can't really, yeah, I, I can't, I, I can't live with that. Like I, I'm, I just tough, could man. not, I could not do that. Yeah, it's tough. And you know, you think about, um, whether in a tactical unit, cause I, I've, I've been on different tactical units, you know, you're with five, six, seven, eight, you know, you know, if you look at like 
the Delta guys, you know, if they're assaulting with multiple troops, you know, 20, 30 guys, if yeah, yeah. flashbang, night vision, different scenario, the regular, yeah, different scenario. And so now you're asking a patrol officer go in with a, with a pistol, if he's lucky, a rifle, um, depending on what, uh, handgun they're carrying, you know, 40, 50 rounds, no flashbangs, no smoke. Um, and you're asking them to go assault through a position with somebody that may have, in this case, um, you know, he had an M4 or an AR-15 style rifle, multiple, you know, magazines. So um, the you, a, you a minute ago, Jack, you mentioned in your article about how police are trained and it's t it's tough, man. Like you can't train enough to respond to that right. kind of situation. Right. And right. I, I talked you talked to you guys before we went live, like, you know, Law enforcement is so unique, man. You're not going to respond to active shooters every day. Right. Um, right. You know, I and, be, and, and expecting a police officer, a patrol cop to be a gunslinger, to be a highly trained special operator, counterterrorism guy is just not realistic. It's not fair. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, not fair. fair. It's not fair, especially most agencies. I mean, I'm lucky, even though I, I work in a very violent um, jurisdiction, you know, I, I get great training. We go to the range several times a year. Um, you know, I, I probably every month or two I'm, I'm in some kind of training class. Um, not every agency is like that. Um, I don't know what you've all these tax bases, what they're, you know, how much training those guys get. But is it fair, again, to ask somebody who goes to the range once a year? Right. And usually the state mandated fire courses are usually 30, 40 rounds. Right. The, and, and, uh, and, they're, and they're not tactical training courses either. They're like hit the target. Yes, you're a piece, a Q target, piece of paper. Yeah. And some ag some agencies don't have targets that face, you know, so yeah. you're shooting just a stationary paper target. Yeah. Um, not moving. You're not doing minimal CQB work if you're lucky. So, you know, is it fair to ask people, I'm going to give you minimal training, but then I'm going to expect you to go assault this gunman who's actively right. firing I, I mean, and, I, and at the I, same time, we're giving police officers AR-15s. We're giving them MRAPs. We're giving them all these like previously would have been, you know, people talk about the militarization of the police. We're giving them all the right. toys. We're giving them the funding. Um, but is the training always Useful. there? Right. And when I yeah. when I when I interviewed uh, Eric, um, and, and maybe we should have Eric. I can ask Eric if he'd like to come on and speak to this himself, but. Uh, he had a real problem with that, that the police are undertrained. He feels uh, that they rely too much on simunitions, uh, which for people who don't know, it's like paintballs um, in training for active shooter scenarios. And he's a big advocate of live fire um, so that officers yeah, yeah, yeah. are not hearing live rounds for the first time during a critical incident like yeah. this. Um, what do you think, Bill? Is there a problem with... Uh, I've heard many different excuses or different reasons. I mean, is there a, a problem or are there some, what are the institutional hurdles that have to be overcome to get the police officers um, to the level of training um, that maybe we would like them to have? Uh, yeah. Cashola. Yeah. M money. Yeah. That's the first one is money. And the second would be mindset of um, the leadership. And so, you know, that type of training costs money. And, you know, a, a couple years ago, a friend of mine and I, uh, uh, most special operations, um, whether it's SEALs, uh, Delta, Dev Group, the Tier 1 guys, I don't know what you guys did in the regular special forces, Jack, but um, like the SEALs, don't they do an 18-month workup and then they're deployed for 18 months? Does that sound right? Um, they, defi months, they definitely, yeah, they definitely do an extensive work uh, workup. In SF, we called it PMT, pre-mission training. And then you have a course like okay. uh, Cephalic, which is like four weeks, five weeks of urban combat, urban and CQB combat. Um, pretty extensive. And, and to give a cephalic course to law enforcement officers or a, a, a law enforcement version of that. Yeah. I imagine that would cost a hell of a lot and of money. And not just the course, but there's maintenance, right? And I mean, I would say that and, like yeah. Rangers, an individual Ranger will shoot more in a week before they like in their train up, they'll shoot more than a, in a week 
than most cops oh, get easily. issued in a year. Easily. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Un it's so unfair. It's, yeah. My point is that um, when you get taken off the street to go train, right. guess what's happening? Nobody's People on the street. People are still calling 911, man. Right. People are still are like, you know, right. uh, so and so has been shot. Like, my husband's beating me. Like, the calls still keep coming. So, you know, not only is it money, institutional Time. mindset from leadership, both from like mayors, city council, board of supervisors, whatever. It also, I mean, you would have to expand the size of law enforcement um, to get, to be able to have coverage. So the 911 calls would still get handled by people go, you know, to two, three day, four day courses. Um, and I think it's doable. A, a friend of mine, I'm KZ, we, we came up with this concept um, because uh, I think the HRT guys kind of follow a Delta model if I'm not mistaken and they, maybe it's changed and I, I could be all fucking out of whack here, but I think it's like, uh, six weeks of training, six weeks deployed. And then it's like six weeks or maybe it's three, I think it's three months, three months of training, three months, uh, like deployed or ready. And then three months where you're like in a support role. And so if law enforcement could come up with a system where it's like, you're working for, you know, three weeks, it's three weeks of training, whether that's driving, shooting, first aid, CQB, um, and then you go back to the street instead of the cycle now where, you know, training in law enforcement, I have to be honest. I mean, I, I luckily I work in a great agency with a lot of money where it's very violent. We get a lot of great training. Um, but in a lot of agencies, training is, is not looked at. It's looked at a waste of time. Right. Um, no, you're, it, it, it screws your coworkers because now they're out handling calls for service. Right. Um, so it's not looked at positively. And the other thing, too, is <clears throat> in some respects, law enforcement hasn't always reached out to the best trainers. Right. You know, we regurgitated. We've hired trainers that just regurgitate stuff that they've heard that they've not experienced before. Um, we need to do a better job of hiring better trainers. Right. Yeah, I mean, because the I think that like your idea is great, and people would have to be willing to say, okay, we need to increase our police force by three. You know, a three. We need a three times larger so that we can have this cycle, so that they can be trained. And for and for police officers, we're not just talking about firearms training, but we we're talking about negotiations. We're talking about you know, uh, it's uh, mental health. I mean, police officers often get uh, very little um, training in how to deal with with the mental health stuff, I and mean, whether it's for themselves or for the public that they have to engage yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's a national <clears throat> there's a national program called CIT Crisis Intervention. Um, a lot of agencies are trained in that. It's a national program you can look, but some agencies aren't. And, you know, I, I deal with mental health every day on the job. Like I'm dealing with somebody who's mentally ill every single day. Um, and you just, you can't get enough of, you know, the tactical stuff, man, is you guys know it's a totally perishable skill. And there are cops that I, I talk about this sometimes when I'm do, doing training. There are people who are not skilled in firearms they're intimidated by firearms and they just want to go to the range, get it over with the state mandates, a 70% score um, on a 50 round course. They just go, they shoot their 70. They hope they never have to draw their gun again and they drive home. And, you know, we need to change that mindset in law enforcement if we can. Yeah. And I mean, not to excuse the police officers in this specific instance, if they did something wrong, which I think the investigation will, 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 will read that when it's complete. But, um, we throw a lot of cops. We expect a lot. We expect them to resolve all of these different issues that we have in society. Um, from some guy having a mental breakdown to, uh, domestic a, abuse, a, domestic child abuse, abuse to, to a, ho know. to a hostage barricade situation. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's a lot, man. And I'm a big proponent. There are a lot of stuff that I, I should not be responding to. There are a lot of mental health calls I go on that somebody who's unarmed, a shrink. who's a, a trained mental health worker can handle yeah, that. Yeah. There's no reason that I'm involved in that. Um, but how, like, so, how do you know that? Like, how does nine, how does nine, nine, one, how would they know that 
when they got the call and dispatched it? <clears throat> well, if I call 911, Dave, and I say, hey, you know what? I'm having a bad day and I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to kill myself. I'd really like to talk to somebody. Oh, right. Okay. That happens, I see, I see. Every, that happens every day where I work. I see and there saying. is no need for a police response for that. Right. That is something we can put somebody on the phone with a mental health worker. Mm -hmm. um, we can have a mental health worker respond. And a lot of cops are like, oh, well, what if they're armed? You know, oh, my God. And and there there are some safety concerns that we would have to address with that. But for the most part, there are a lot of mental health calls that should not. And this is not just true where I work. I mean, this is nationwide. There are a lot of mental health calls that should not involve the police. And frankly... There are times, you know, my agency, as busy as we are, we still get my 11 year old won't go to school. My 11 year old, um, you know, um, you know, hit their cell phone and won't give me the cell phone, to, won't give me the code to their cell phone. Like we still get as busy we are with the shootings and the violence. That should not be a police response. I'm really an out of control do, nine year old. Do you like, have why to, am I responding? Do you have to respond to those calls then? Unless the supervisor comes on the radio and says, we're not going to that. Yes. Now wow. my agency is trying to get better at that. We, we have a committee and the chief is really trying to work on getting us to not respond to those types of calls. Um, and nationwide, there's a real push for that. Um, and there's a whole separate conversation, man. There, there's like some case law that came out in the 60s, 70s called the community caretaker doctrine, where the courts decided that the police had to respond to these things they had to problem solve and so for decades the police felt like they had to go they had to solve this problem and the courts have kind of reversed that a little bit and i'm like wait a second they've pulled mm -hmm. back on this community caretaker doctrine and now you know i'm not really expected to solve that problem it, it might be better handled by a social services worker um, or, or somebody else so have there been any big m movements, you know, because we had the big defund the police and then it was, well, we don't want to defund the police. What we're saying is, is we, we want to like cut some of that budget and have better mental health, mental health services, things like, like, has there been that type of movement to take over that community care type of role? Um, there has been, um, Virginia, where I work passed a law called the Marcus law or Marcus alert law where uh, there was a, a famous guy, Marcus Peterson, who was killed in Richmond. Uh, he was naked running down the interstate. Um, he attacked a police officer and was shot and killed. And it was a really sad story. He was a high school teacher, I think, or a middle school teacher, uh, and was having some sort of mental crisis, whether he got a hold of like some marijuana that was laced with something. Something was out of whack for him to run down the interstate mm -hmm. naked. Uh, he, they tried to tase him. The tasing didn't work. And I, I think he told the officer he was going to kill him. So the officer shot him in broad daylight. Um, and so there has been a push uh, to remove the police from that situ from those type of situations where a mental health worker um, is, is more adept to handle that. Now, I, what I personally and professionally think the best model is like a hybrid model yeah. where you have a dedicated police unit one or two officers that respond out with a mental health worker and you right. let the mental health worker try um, first right. to see what they can get. And then maybe they wave the police off. You're not needed here. But um, a lot of age, some, I shouldn't say a lot. Some agencies have gone to that hybrid model where those officers are embedded with mental health workers are not part of like a regular 911 dispatch or patrol officers. Right. No, that makes sense. I mean, like they need bouncers, Right, the the mental health workers. Yeah, you, I mean, you you can't send somebody. Muscle, they need muscle, Dave. Yeah, just in case. Yeah, you, uh, you should talk to my mom, who's a social worker. They do send social workers into potentially very dangerous I, situations. I, yeah, I, I imagine, like you know. Yeah, 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 and um, I mean, here here in Virginia, the mental health system is really broken, man. Um, though every state has some version of what's called an emergency custody order. In Virginia, every state has a version of that where a person is taken into police custody to be forcefully evaluated by a mental health worker. Um, in Virginia, it's a totally broken system, man, where unfortunately people end up handcuffed to a hospital bed for three, four, five days. 
um, waiting to be admitted to a mental health facility. Uh, it's really sad. Unfortunately, the police end up being um, the middleman in that. Right. And um, the mental health system, they need more money. They need more workers. So, you know, and um, the, the system is just so overwhelmed. And, you know, it relates back to what we were talking about earlier, guys, about as far as, you know, if there's a kid in my class who everybody in the classroom says that's going to be the next school shooter, why isn't that person getting the help that they need? Uh, whether, you know, they're institutionalized, whether, you know, they're forcefully taken into custody and taken before, um, you know, uh, evaluated in, in a confined facility. So the system is just broken. Yeah. I mean, I think that like when you look at the homeless population in New York and, and the mentally ill people that are are there, you know, like for a lot of them, it's either the streets or prison because they're not they're not functional. They're not going to hold the nine to five job, unfortunately, at least not without without help. And it was sort of the institutions going away. I, I mean, I can see how the institutions were uh, can be abused, too. Like it's once again, it's one of those those nuanced issues. But there are a lot of people in New York. They've cut the number of hospital beds that are available for, yeah. for people. Yeah. Like and ask, ask your mom, Jack. I, I think there was a famous documentary, right, in the 50s, 60s, or 70s where somebody smuggled a camera into one of these mental institutions and it was like appalling conditions. I think it was broadcast on the news. Oh, wow. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm, ask, I'm not ask aware your mom. It. It's yeah. very famous in social worker uh, kind of circles. But yeah, you're. Somebody you're you're definitely right. I mean, back in the in the fifties, sixties, I mean, there was deplorable conditions. Right. I mean, and what was happening to people in, in mental institutions? Right. For sure. I mean, we have we have the same Terrible. types of issues and abuses in the foster care system, right? Like mm -hmm. it needs to be there. It serves a function. You don't want to get rid of the foster care service, the system, but it needs the foster care system also needs total reform, right? Without right. question, you yeah. know. Right. You guys are depressing me, man. I Sorry, know, man. <laughs> nice. A little. All right. All right. All right, you guys, Bill. You guys have people on here who are talking about like, <laughs> man, I was riding on the little bird. I came into Baghdad. You know, we, we assaulted this. We rescued these hostages. And then I'm on here talking about fucking mental illness, man. Dude, it, uh, I, uh, it, it sounds odd, but I love my job when I get to write about operators shooting terrorists. Um, that's pretty cool. <laughs> But when I have to write about, I, and I do, I write about a lot of suicides, murders, domestic violence, sex assault stuff in the military, and that shit just really bums me out. I mean, it'll bum anybody out. It it sucks. It ju it just does. So let, let's shift gears a little bit. And I know we've established you weren't in Colombia, but do you have any other funny Secret Service stories that you haven't laid on us yet, or or any funny law enforcement Bill, for, stories? For you know, we kind of skipped this at the front, uh, at, at the top because you have been on the show before. But for the people who maybe are are new um, and haven't gone back yet and watched, you know, all of our past library, can right. you give us can you give us a little bit of your origin story? Oh yeah, sorry man. I skipped. I skipped way over that. We, and, um, it, it's our fault. We dropped the ball. Yeah, no worries. I didn't think people really cared to hear it, but uh, you know, for people that didn't hear the we first cared. one, you know, um, and if you guys, you guys have so many people on, you probably don't remember, but you know, uh, if you guys remember, my mom was SJW before there was SJW, man. Um, <laughs> so I, I grew up. Uh, you know, in an environment where, where my mom was, you know, very pro interracial marriage. I mean, my mom yanked me up out of a couple churches when I was a little kid because the pastor was uh, from the pulpit talking about the evils of interracial marriage. And my mom was like, we're out. Um, so I grew up, my, my mom was uh, very charitable. Uh, I grew up, I, I think I told you guys previously, you know, my dad was in the Navy and my dad did like 24 years and, um, my mom had a real heart, uh, I think, because she had lived this herself, where these young women, you know, they're 18, they marry their high school sweetheart from D Dubuque, Iowa, and he joins the Navy, and they wake up one day, and they're in Norfolk, Virginia, and they're 19, pregnant, and the washing machine breaks, and he's out to sea. Right. And my mom had a real heart for those type of women. Um, my mom, there was like just revolving door of women, man. My mom was always helping these these poor women out. And uh, so when I was a young kid during the Reagan assassination, I watched that happen on uh, TV. 
And I remember asking my sister and dad, you know, who were those guys in suits? And they were like, oh, that's the Secret Service. And I just always aspired to, to enter into the Secret Service. And so that's what I ended up doing. And um, I, I think I got sort of this passion for public service, man, where this need to just um, the downtrodden to help people. The guys I work with tease me all the time because, you know, I pull into a Wawa and I'll see a homeless person. I'm like, when's the last, my first words, man, when's the last time you had something to eat? And they're like yesterday. And so, you know, I'll take a guy, a homeless guy in and buy him dinner at the Wawa. I just did this yesterday, talking to a homeless girl and, and, and bought her some dinner. And so I get that from my mom. I think I get like, I want to fucking kick in a door and, you know, uh, arrest somebody from my dad. So, you know, and my then I'll buy him a Wawa. Boring, man. I'll arrest him and then buy him a Wawa, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my origin story is pretty boring, man. I mean, I, I, I saw the Reagan assassination on TV and I, I thought that who are these guys that are willing to lay down their life for the president? I just thought that was really cool. And so I joined the Secret Service um, shortly after college. I was a local police officer and uh, got hired with the Secret Service. And I was there for about 13 years and then went into local law enforcement in 2013. And, um, you know, uh, I took a class with Pat McNamara before anybody knew who Pat McNamara <laughs> was. And I remember the class. This is like 2009, probably. And Pat started the class off by saying, hey, I'm just a guy with a mortgage and a wife. And that's me, man. I'm just a guy with a mortgage and a wife. So and two kids. So do you want more of the origin story, Dave? I, I, I want to, we want to know everything about well, you. Pe though. We people love you, can man. go back and listen to the, the past interview we did with you. I'm, I'm interested in getting to like anything that got left out of the last one. Yeah. Uh, any other wild uh, stories? Oh, wow. Well, I had a ton of people from my secret service days hit me up and, you know, um, like texting me, calling me. Why didn't you, I get a shout out. Why didn't I get any love? <laughs> Um, what about this story? You should have told this one. You should have told that one. Um, I, I, it's funny you say that cause I was just talking, one of my uh, buddies I work with now, um, his on again, off again, girlfriend is in Vegas and, um, currently in Vegas. And I was telling him last night, um, I knew a guy, uh, who was not on cat with me. He actually was on the uniform division side, who was a counter sniper in the secret service thing goes called CS. He was married, um, went to Vegas for a secret service trip and got, ended up getting Shanghai there because the, the trip ended up getting canceled and it was during the campaign. So they kind of left him there while they were figuring out like where he was going to launch to next. And so he decided to do a little partying. Um, this is a true story, man. This guy was married, lived in Maryland. He got married twice in Vegas over like a five day period, <laughs> went to like the wedding chapels and got married twice. <laughs> um, yeah, he had to come back and like he came back and ended up having to fly back out to Vegas to like sign the paperwork to get the weddings like annulled or whatever you do in Vegas. So what's yeah. uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm <laughs> two strong. different women, two different women. He got I'm, married twice, two different women. I was trying to find the words, but like you're running up against like polygamy laws at this point. <laughs> It's Vegas, man. Yeah. It's Las Vegas. Vegas, uh, another Salt Lake guy, City. It's, another it's all guy, good. Uh, another guy hit me up. Um, was like, you should have told this story. We, I don't remember what year this was. Um, I talked a lot about one of my team leaders, KE. He was the one in the episode one. You can go back and listen. But he was the one that decided not to launch when we were in Mumbai and called yeah. the international incident. Uh, later, several months later, I went on a trip with KE and we went from Finland, uh, to Moldova to Chisinau, which is the capital of Moldova. Um, have you guys, have either one of you ever been to a former Russian Republic? Uh, I, yeah, uh, I, or a yeah. former Soviet Union, like, or yeah, I mean, I, we've been to the stands, like, uh, I've been to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Check. Okay. Uh, so probably Moldova is probably very similar. Um, 
I think I sent you guys a picture. It might not have shown up, but uh, there's a picture I sent with me and some Moldovan special forces guys. Um, depressing country, man. Like the architecture, like everything is that old Soviet, like flat yeah, style yeah. architecture. Um, they warned us in the pre-country brief. They said, hey, um, there have been several guys from the embassy. Moldovan women are known to be the most beautiful in Eastern Europe. And there have been several guys from the embassy that had left their wives and families to marry um, these Moldovan women. Because, And I'm not lying, man. I was like, yeah, right, whatever. And then when we got there, I was like, dude, he is right. There are amazingly beautiful women. And one of the guys from my team was like, yeah, right they go from supermodel to coal miner because they all smoke. They all fucking drink vodka. <laughs> uh, but so we landed, we had like two days down and the guy from the embassy said, Hey, um, I'm going to take you guys out. So he took me and KE and a couple guys from my team out. And he was like, don't worry. You're going to be comped. Um, we're, I'm going to take you to this place. I've reserved the entire place for you guys. Don't worry. So I've been trying to get got the over digits. There. This is this is a Moldovan woman. I can't I can't explain the connection on on air. <laughs> Why does she have a mustache? <laughs> I've been asking for the digits from my from my friend. Uh, I have not received them yet, but I'm working it. Anyway, is she beautiful? I'm, is, she so, beautiful? is she beautiful? She she is a ten. Easy. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Trust me when I tell you this, because I've been to Moldova, she will be a coal miner in about five years because they, they all drink and, and smoke vodka and the men treat them like shit over there. But come to America. So this guy from the embassy was, <laughs> guy from the embassy was like, I'm going to take you guys. I, I've reserved this restaurant for you. Don't worry. So it was this guy from the embassy. So we go, um, you know, we go out to this embassy and, uh, or sorry, we, we, we go out with this guy from the embassy. We had a couple down days and we go in and my first clue should have been the guys in the turtlenecks and black leather jackets, smoking <laughs> cigarettes, working the door, didn't pay attention. We go in and there was nobody there. It was just us. And it was the Moldovan strip club. And the embassy guy was like, ah, it's cool, man. Yeah. Don't worry. They serve food here and everything. <laughs> And they brought all this food. It was just us, the most beautiful women you could imagine, like dancing on the stage. We ate and drank like kings. Well, the embassy guy was like, man, I got an early meeting today. I got, you know, I got, I got to bug out. And at this point, we, you know, we had been drinking for a couple hours. Like, yeah, it's cool. We'll get a cab back. Yeah, woo. Um, so we were told that everything was comped. <laughs> uh, so we drank for a couple more hours. Well, then one of the guys in turtlenecks and the leather jackets, um, delivered the bill and it was like 3000 us, man. <laughs> um, I forget what the Moldovan currency was, right. but the equivalent I remember later on, we discovered was like 3000 us. Well, none of us had that. We didn't have it. Um, so one of these big bouncers, a uh, total Russian mafia man was like, you're going to pay. And we were like, you. we don't have it. And so he hustled me and KE into a car and he drove us to the only ATM in, in <laughs> Chisinau that would um, like three of these huge Russian dudes, man, like in this tiny car, big muscle guys drove us. It seemed like an hour is clear across Chisinau to the only ATM that would dispense American dollars, not in the embassy. It was this weird ATM, and they esc escorted us <laughs> to the ATM. Uh, KE's, the first card that he tried to use got declined, right? Because whose bank is going to approve yeah, an ATM right. withdrawal right. now for $500? Right. So between him and me, I think I tried three cards and was able to get like 700 bucks. I think uh, I almost said his name here. He'd kill me. He was able to get like seven or 800 bucks. Uh, we had, so we had to pay off these Russian mobsters, man, in Chisinau, Moldova, so we could get our buddies out of the uh, Moldovan strip club. 
That's insane. Do so. What happened when you like approach this dude at the embassy? Later on, yeah. Did he you get was like, oh yeah, sorry, man. Um, yeah, that's my boy, so and so. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I'll have to work it out with him. And he was just some puke, man. I mean, we were leaving the next day anyway, or two days later. He, um, he was probably getting that box sheesh, you know. He was getting commission yeah, yeah, on you yeah. guys. Maybe, or he, <laughs> he probably knew a girl there. It probably he knew a girl that was dancing. Is probably what it was. <laughs> Yeah, when it comes to the girls, uh, I always uh, keep in mind, we had a counterintelligence guy on here one time. He said, it's really important to know your number. Because if you're like a fat, balding, middle-aged guy, Easy. and suddenly, you're not fat. D, what's going on here, man? You're not fat. You're just balding. Uh, and, and like, a, and like a, a 10, like Moldovan woman comes up to you and laughs at all of your stupid dad jokes and thinks all of your lame stories are really interesting, you need to start asking yourself some really important questions about what's happening in that moment. I need to reevaluate yeah, my yeah, entire I, relationship. I talked about that. I talked about that in episode one because that's how the Columbia scandal unfolded was um, a guy not knowing his number. That's uh, Art Huntington was the guy from Cat that got the whole – that whole Secret Service scandal, that's how the whole thing started, was a guy not knowing his number. So – um, you do have to know your number. Um, I tell you, M Moldova, man, I've never seen more beautiful women. I totally encourage you, Jack, to pursue that. I don't know what you're going to do there. Put me in the game, coach. <laughs> we're gonna, I'm ready for this. We're, 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 uh, we're going to get Jack a ticket to Moldova. He's going to broadcast live from Moldova. This, might, this may not be the best time in history for your pal Jack to make a little <laughs> vacation trip to Moldova. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> with my Yankee passport and what comes up when you Google my name, it might not be good for me. I'm just saying. Maybe, yeah, maybe we can. From Syria, may have questions. Maybe we can meet in a neutral third country. You know, a dinner date in Geneva, Vienna. Yeah, I'm down for that. Las Vegas, married two of them. How did there. you? How did you meet this? This was on Instagram. How no, no, I, it's a, it's, it's my friends wife's half sister that's the connection and my buddy says yeah this is my my wife's sister and i'm like buddy you gotta get me the digits like you can't just show me a picture of this and, and think i'm not gonna try to follow up on this um yeah if uh hopefully none of them actually see this interview or i'll, I'll get an earful later um <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. but every, but but when you say that the most beautiful women you've ever seen in your in your life, I mean, it checks out, Bill. It checks out. <laughs> it checks out. I, I, there, no no oh. li no lies detected in this interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a fun trip, man. We uh, we started in Finland, and um, have you guys been to Finland? It's very expensive, no. gorgeous country, but very expensive. Very expensive. We worked uh, with the, uh, I don't know if it was the Finnish Special Forces or they had a police tactical unit. I can't remember. I've got some pictures somewhere um, I'd have to dig up. But do you guys have any any other questions, man? Like, it's hard for me to come up with Secret Service stories, like, on a dime. Well, like, something has to hit me to do, trigger me. Do, do you remember? And, and I think about it. Do you remember when, when like, your buddies were contacted you after the last show? Do you remember any of the stories they said you should have told? Um, well, the Moldovan story, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, geez, man. Um, how how often some, did you guys travel? Some, some, how often did you, you say? Guys, how often did you guys travel? Because it seemed like you were gone all oh. the time. When I was on Cat, man, like... 180 days a year, maybe 200 days, depending and, you know, depending on what trip you volunteered for, um, you know, some of the, uh, shift guys, the guys on PPD or VP are, are traveling even more than that. Sometimes less, it just depends. Um, you know, some of the stories, man, I mean, nothing illegal or unethical was done. I want to make that very clear. Uh, we believe um, you. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not morally, but um, some of the stories, guys were texting me like, you better, t you should have told that story. I was like, absolutely not, because the internet is forever. The internet is forever, so I'm not telling those stories. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, something, you know, I was there for, you know, 
12 plus years and on cat for almost seven. And so I have so many stories and something has to trigger me. And I don't know if I told this the, the last time, you know, the, the secret service man is, is a lot more driving miss Daisy or not driving miss Daisy. Sorry. A guarding Tess is a lot more guarding Tess. Uh huh. Uh, and I think I talked about that in the last, and this is not to diminish the secret service at all. It's just the nature of what they do. Um, it's a lot more guarding tests than like zero dark 30, man. My, or, um, there are some zero dark 30 fire, moments. Right? Yeah. Or what's that yeah, movie? Line, line of fire. fire. That's actually better now, Dave. Yes. Yeah. What, what's that movie, movie with though. Gerald Butler where he's like a secret service oh, guy, uh, but like uh, the Olympus, apocalypse Olympus happens. Olympus has fallen. Yeah, yeah. Olympus is fun. Terrible, terrible. I think there's even another one with Christian Tatum or what's that guy? What's that guy's name? Channing Tatum. Tatum. Channing Tatum. Yeah. 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 Even worse. But I think he's like a, um, isn't he a like fallen Capitol police officer or something that finds his way into the white house or something? Yeah. Yeah. It's much more guarding tests every day. Um, you know, than um, than people realize Great outfit, man. Phenomenal people. I was very lucky to be there. I worked with very competent people. The guy I talked about at the beginning of the podcast um, was super competent, a hell of a guy. He just had it out for me and he didn't like me. Uh, but a very, very competent dude. And, you know, there's incredibly proficient, competent people there, very smart. You know, I worked with Ivy League people. Um, Sorry to pick on Ivy League people, Jack. Uh, is Columbia Ivy League? I can't remember. Depends who you ask, isn't actually. That, isn't that second tier Ivy League? Columbia? Is that second tier Ivy League? Honorary Ivy, maybe? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's tough to remember these stories, man. I, I um, on, on the spot, like something that just has to what, hit me. Uh, buddies did tell me in the last episode. What what about uh, going to Baghdad with the Secret Service, doing presidential protection in a war zone? Uh, I, I'd be interested to hear what that was like. Yeah, so um, at the time, uh, sort of a new mission for the Secret Service, right? Like, um, so I joined in two thousand two, and I I'd have to go back and look at a calendar or some news reports. Um. In 2003 or 2004, I think was the first war zone trip. There's a famous thing. Bush was smuggled out of his Crawford ranch. Yeah, yeah. Um, so new thing for the Secret Service. And then, um, you know, every probably couple times a year, either the president or the vice president or even the national security advisor, other people in the government were making trips to Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, I, I went to Afghanistan. I talked about that in the first episode. So, you know, um so the Secret Service had to uh, sort of not really rethink the protection model, but had to sort of adopt a new model to go to the war zones and um, started really interacting a lot with the tier one units when we would go over. So, for instance, I know one time we went to Afghanistan and it, uh, I don't remember which time it was that I went there. It might have been um, one of the times um, that I talked about in the first episode, but uh we had some um, Delta guys with us and they were bitching and complaining because um, uh, correct me uh, if I'm wrong here, Jack, about Afghanistan, because it's been years since I, I, I was there listening. But it was like the first either full moon or dull moon. And they they, they were going to go on a raid and they were waiting for the moon to be like a crescent moon or something. So it would be so bright. Does that sound right? Yeah, that, that could quite possibly be the case. Um, the pil- okay, helicopter so pilots them- probably would rather it be a little overcast. Okay, so I remember them complaining that it was the first like overcast moon and they, they had to put off a mission so they could come in bed with us for this um, presidential mission. But at the time, I mean, it was, you know, the situation was still pretty unstable. So usually the president um, never left the airfield. Right. They would just give a big uh, hoorah speech to the troops and go to the chow and, hall and um, serve food and go to the chow hall, food. shake some hands, fo- pose for some photographs. But they still, you know, we had to have these protection protocols in place. Um, when I went with Biden to Baghdad in the trip I talked about in the beginning of the uh, episode, um, 
he went to the embassy and stayed at the embassy. I don't think he left the embassy. But if you guys remember at this time, I know both you guys remember this. The cool thing for the State Department people was to wear suits and the combat boots, mm-hmm. like uh, Bremer. Bremer. Remember Bremer oh, was yeah. there? Yeah. yeah. That was the cool thing, or 5'11s and a polo and a flak jacket. That was like, you were the cool embassy person. So um, the service had to redo a lot of protection protocols. And then, you know, um, I don't know if I told this in the first episode, but it got to be a problem because you would have to be, they would have to, you have to think about this, man. They're smuggling out the leader of the free world, Mm -hmm. right? From either the White House or from their private, from like a, a separate private residence like Waco or Crawford. Texas, for in the case of President Bush, so you would have to smuggle out the leader of the free world. So the service has this term called OTR, off the record, right? And what that OTR means is that if nobody else knows the protectee is leaving and going somewhere, the chances of a planned assassination attempt are pretty nil because nobody knows that they're leaving. Right. And so in Obama's case, the OTR, they would just smuggle him out in like a small, there was one time that Obama was taken to Andrews and like a crown Victoria, just like an unmarked black crown Victoria, unarmored, followed by just like a suburban with minimal agents and driven to Andrews. But because nobody knew about it, it was totally safe, right? So one of the war zone trips he took, that's how he was smuggled out of the White House. So uh, one of the times, um, I believe it was that Baghdad trip, um, we were told because it's DC, right? And everybody, everything leaks, every piece of news leaks. And so, um, that, you know, you have to come up with these cover stories for your family. Cause you can't go home and tell your wife, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to be in Baghdad for four days or five days. Don't tell anybody, you know, cause your family member is probably going to call the mother-in-law or call your mom and say, Oh, Bill's going to Baghdad again, blah, blah, blah. So they have to come up with these cover stories. And so basically we were told, this information is classified. You know, we got called into a skiff. You're going to be leaving. Tell your family going on a training operation. So, um, I uh, had told my wife going on a training operation. I left, um, and they they pulled out all the stops, man. Like we got driven to Andrews in these like blacked out like minivans, like no windows. And I think I talked about this in the first episode. There's red lines around the hangar at Air Force One, and it says deadly force authorized. And when you drive into the hangar, the air, the, um, the squadron that handles Air Force One, you can eat off the floor in there, man. It is They take such pride in maintaining that hangar in the aircraft that there is like no drips of aircraft grease or anything on the floor. Like it is pristine. The bathrooms, like I went in while we were waiting to load up on Air Force One, I went into one of the u- bathrooms in the hangar. Dude, you'd eat out of the urinal. It was like pristine. They take like ultimate pride in me. This is like the presidential aircraft, the presidential hangar. So anyway, fly over there. While we're there, um, uh, you know, the, they would wait. They would always wait to release it to the media when uh, the president was wheels up or the vice president was wheels up, release it to the media. Um, the media would usually be embedded on board, but they could like, you know, text their editors or whatever. Hey, you can release it now. So one of the trips I was on, told my wife I was on a training operation and my wife was at a neighborhood party and talking with a couple other wives and, uh, they were like, oh, is Bill traveling in? Yeah, he's on a training operation. He's training for something with the president. And they were like, wow, because the president's in Baghdad. Are you sure you know where he's at? <laughs> and uh, well, I was like, I'm pretty sure he's there. I'm pretty sure he's on this job. And like when I, I ended up, when we land, we went. And then when we landed back, we had to refuel in um, Germany. I had a chance to like text her. Um, or email her, hey, I'm in Germany, this is where I went. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, she was not very happy. She expressed her displeasure that <laughs> it looked like 
these other like neighborhood moms were like, huh. are you sure? Is that really where he's right, at? Right. So yeah, back to your original question, Jack, you know, yeah, the secret service had to rethink their whole model as far as, you know, cause a lot of these agents have wives, man, they have kids and then you're going to pull these guys out and you're going to do like a comms blackout. What, what do the green berets call it? Like not blackout, but what do you call it when you go into isolation Iso or whatever? It's yeah. isolation. Yeah. 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 Well, it's one thing to do that to a Green Beret man or right. an SF guy, but it's totally another thing to do it to a Secret Service agent. Right. So, like, um, the Secret Service had to overcome those challenges. And, you know, uh, that really started the interoperability with some of the Tier 1 units with um, DevGuru and, and Delta. Uh, at the time, I think DevGuru was, in, you know, really running the show in Afghanistan, if I'm remembering yeah. this right. And um, Delta had Iraq. And so... Um, bouncing between the two tier one units. We started doing a lot of training down at Bragg and Damn Neck. Um, we would go down about once a month down to train with those guys. And then a um, little known fact, man, this is embarrassing for, for Kat. In fact, I was just talking to an old team leader of mine yesterday who called me. Um, when the Columbia scandal happened, one of the cat guys who was down there, who was the cat advance, he was the cat advance for that Columbia trip. He had a Delta guy embedded with him when the whole scandal broke. Uh, and the reason for that was twofold. One, um, uh, you know, uh, Delta does a lot of their protective operations. You can read about it in both like Jerry Boykin's book, uh, Eric Haney's book. They talk about how they got secret service training uh, for their protective operations. Um, so he was there to learn how the secret service, listen, man, secret service best in the world for, um, advanced, uh, as far as they do their protective advance, mm -hmm. right? There's a whole academic science, how there is so much that goes into advanced, um, what is Delta called? Advanced force operations, like I think, or yeah. AFO or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the advance for protection on the secret service side, man, best in the world. Cause uh, there's a saying, right. Um, uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics, and you've got to be like, it's all logistics, man. Where are we getting gas motorcade route? Like, um, how long are we going to be there? What about food? Uh, all that stuff plays in. And so he had a Delta guy embedded with him to kind of learn the science of um, advanced protective operations. And uh, so sorry to be long winded about that. But, yeah, the service had to re sort of like in increase their capabilities with those war zone trips. It's really weird, right? I mean, the idea of a president going to a war zone, like Kennedy never went to Vietnam that I know of, did he? Uh you know, or Eisen, or, or did uh, Reagan ever F go to Lebanon or F anything? Did Reagan oh. go to Lebanon? Did he? I don't, I don't know, but so. I mean, did FDR didn't? I mean, I know Churchill went to England, but FDR never like FDR never went to Europe. You know, uh, for that, for Eisen, that good Eisenhower press, was not his president though. For, for that good press moment, <laughs> yeah, um, it's just such a weird thing. Honestly, like living in New York, I wish presidents would just stay in the White House. Um, <laughs> Every time they come yeah. through here, it's a nightmare. And I'll tell you things that, you know, again, back to how the service had to rethink things. It, it got to be um, where things were so secretive about these war zone trips. Okay. So I did a stint in CAT operations. This was before I became a team leader on CAT. And so CAT operations is like four guys from CAT in this operations center with screens up everywhere. And you're managing like, Flights, car planes, uh, weapons permits, passports, um, visas, country entries, everything. It was the most stressful time I was on cat, man, was my stand in cat ops. Super high pressure. It was awful. I hated it. My phone was ringing all hours of the days and night. So when I was in cat ops, there was a war zone trip. And I had the rare Sunday off. And I traveled down to Richmond to visit my in-laws with my wife and kid. And we were leaving to go to church, man. I'll never forget this one. The driveway of my mother-in-law's house. And my phone, my work phone starts blowing up. And it was a cat team leader who I knew. I'm not going to say his name, JW. 
he had called me like four times and I took his call as my mother-in-law and my wife were loading into the car and I was like, Hey, JW, is everything okay? A tie expletive lace tirade ensued. You motherfucker just started blasting me. Two cat teams, the midnight shift and the day shift had sat at the white house thinking the president was there. But he was actually oh, on one wow. of these work trips, and they they did it because they didn't want to like if Change anybody the profile. was watching. Yeah, business as usual. Yep, business as usual. And he was furious that they had been sitting guarding um, the president who wasn't even there. He was furious and made us late to church. My mother in law was furious. Cause he, w I couldn't get him off the phone. He was, you know, just, uh, MF after MF. I don't want to curse on your show, man, but he was like, <laughs> it was, it was awful. And he was furious because they had had two, both the day shift and the evening shift had sat in the white house and there was no one there to protect. That, Let's, uh, hit up some, uh, viewer questions here. That, uh, yeah, that'd be frustrating. Let's see here. Uh, I know we have a few Anthony says, what do you suggest is done if a mag capacity law passes and someone doesn't comply? Who fixes that issue in such an instance and how? I mean, isn't that kind of question sort of answer itself? Like what happens if you don't comply with any other federal law? I mean, what do you, you got to have the hammer, right? There has to be the hammer. I mean, there has to be um, some sort of like negative action. So of course, I mean, follow the law. If that's the law, and then they need to be charged and prosecuted. KJAM says, I cannot emphasize how important Bill's idea of a mixed model on law enforcement work, plus training, plus administrative, plus EMS, et cetera, to reduce trauma, burnout, excessive force complaints, reduce injuries, et cetera, is. Um, yeah, it, it, sounds, it, it sounds really important. And I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add, Bill, but I think when you were addressing like the training cycle or like the, the like, green red cycle that like uh, JSOC units go through or Ranger Regiment goes through, uh, those are like very elite and, and frankly, very expensive units to maintain. Um, and they're very small also. Uh, is it possible to use a model like that nationwide for police officers, some sort of on off cycle? Absolutely, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you guys remember uh, the September 11th commission? If you remember, they said the reason September 11th happened. Um, the September 11th, the September 11th commission said that terrorist attack happened because of a failure of imagination. Yeah. And yes, failure of imagination, man. Again. I can get every piece of information ever created in the history of mankind on this iPhone. And you're telling me we can't come up with a like on off cycle for law enforcement training. It, it can happen. BP Izzy says in response to K jam, the last question, it's about price. Some of us pay for it ourselves out of our own pockets because the agency will not it's expensive, but K jam is correct. We need a lot of training. Uh, uh, we also have a couple questions on Patriot from, uh, Isaac. He said, um, this is kind of a, well, this in, uh, dear Mr. Gage, there is something I want to ask you since 2020, because of your background in counterfeit investigations, um, do you have an educated guess of where the fake $20 that George Floyd may have come from? Cause that was what brought them to the scene to begin with, right? Was the counterfeit 20? Yeah, he tried to pay with a counterfeit. Um, what was it? Educated guess? Yeah, because that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna give yeah. here. They were probably like just a shitty printer counterfeit man. Just yeah. probably somebody printed. You can also do what's called a bleach bill, where you can take a one dollar bill. Believe it or not, you can actually take Clorox and bleach the ink off the bill, and then put it into a printer and print out a uh, twenty or a hundred. Oh, so it was probably just a shitty just a shitty printer note or P note. That's what the secret service used to call it a P note, which means it was just with a printer. That would be my guess. I mean, I I've heard an urban myth in the past and you, you can confirm whether or not this is like relatively true, but like everybody at some point in time has held counterfeit twenties that there are so many in circulation. Um, 
Do you feel like I that's... I doubt that's true, Dave. Okay. I think that's an urban legend, man. Yeah. Um, if you remember back when I was talking about the Super Note, do you remember I how I Korea. said the Super Note originally was discovered was a bank teller? In yeah. The Philippines, um, yeah. The money doesn't feel right. That's right, so, in the Philippines. Yeah, I, I that's think right. That's urban legend. That's interesting. Programming um, note: That's actually a clip on, available on our YouTube channel, so you can check it out. Check oh yeah, out there's the a, not a, yeah. Uh, you made a a clip of his specifically interview, right? for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Isaac also, my coworker in IT wants to know if Secret Service has access to our data online. I don't quite know what he's asking there. Like, what kind of data? Cell phone data, personnel data. I don't know what he's asking, but. Um, uh, I'm going to say no. I mean, there's some really classified programs out there that I know about that I've been read in and read out of, um, specifically related to the protection of the president and like, uh, uh, data. But, um, if somebody tweets, I'm going to kill, you know, if I, I'm going to kill, you know, a, a world leader, if somebody tweets that, will the secret service, will, will the secret service find that out? Do they have filters? Like, like social media, like scrapers or whatever to find that kind of stuff? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, man, there's a lot of classified, highly okay. classified right. programs um, for that specific reason. I'm not going to talk about on the podcast. Sure, but yeah. sure. Uh, don't, don't tweet that shit, man. <laughs> yeah, and don't say it in the comments of our YouTube videos either <laughs> because yeah. I will get a knock on the don't, door from the Secret Service. Don't. You guys are further depressing me, man. I'm going to keep drinking the James. Uh, last question here. This is from James. The logistics of controlling 400 million weapons, 80% unregistered, is impossible. We can't even keep one AK per house in a war zone like Afghanistan. Jack and Dave, I love you. James, we love you too, man. I mean, for real. Like a, like a Moldovian you guys stripper. You guys know James? I, no, I, don't, I have no, no idea who he is. But I, I love him, and I love his support <laughs> yeah. of the Team House live stream and podcast. Thank you, James. Um, cool, man. So, hey, I, I, Bill, I've got a question for you. I, I don't know if you've done any research into this, but what would you say, in order to secure a school the way your children's school is secured, do you know about what that would cost? Because it, in my mind, it doesn't seem like it would be a massive endeavor, but I don't know. We're talking about a couple hundred thousand schools, I guess. Right. Uh, I today, Dave, um, upgraded my alarm system in my house and it cost me probably, I'd have to look at the invoice, 600 bucks, man, to put some alarm. Now I, I already had an alarm system cause I, I use it religiously. I, I, when I go to bed at night, if somebody comes to my house, I want to know, so I use my alarm system religiously when I leave, um, when I come back, uh, you know, I'm in law enforcement. I'm really concerned of the safety of my family. But the point is I upgraded my alarm system, alarms on all the windows, front door, uh, back door and garage door. And I think that cost me like 300 bucks. So my point, the reason I tell you that is technology is cheap, right? I don't think it costs that much money, man. I mean, ring doorbells, and that's the brand name. Google has one. Yeah. Uh, the technology is cheap. Yeah. And do you want to put a cost on making sure children can learn in a safe environment? Like, um, I, I, I don't think we can do that. Like, you know, whatever it costs, let's do it. I think, yeah. I think it really depends on the school, some schools to, uh, and how it's constructed, right? Some would be fairly straightforward and simple. Others that have like an open campus. Oh, like in California, like an open campus. Even in, in sub, like the suburban school I went to high school in, for example, like th those would be more, more difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I yeah, can see that. Yeah, a little bit that. more expensive, yeah. Or you just have bit to more gate expensive. it, at, you know, uh, like gate the whole thing. But that's still tough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't comment on this stuff so often because I'm not a, a law enforcement expert. Uh, it's kind of why, why I leave, ask you these questions, Bill. Um, but... I appreciate your time, man, um, and coming on the show tonight and filling in at the last minute and talk about some things that are very topical and important. And hopefully we had a, a productive conversation and give, uh, I think so. Yeah. Give people something to think about, something to talk about. And, um, 
let the hate mail let the hate mail start right jack on the uh that i'm anti-second amendment that you uh, jack and dave want to ban guns so let it's, the hate mail start yeah man. it's it's co it's coming but i think somewhere within that there's also a healthy conversation and i think that even setting aside the second amendment issue there are a lot of other things we can do um that won't run up against constitutional issues um so next week is going to be uh it's eric olson isn't it uh next week is jim olson jim olson yeah jim, right. uh james olson former uh director of counterintelligence for the cia and guys please why you guys had me on before him embarrassing man you guys have some real heroes on here please well, like a uh, share and subscribe <laughs> to the channel if you haven't already uh down in the description there's a link to our patreon where you get access to bonus episodes and segments and also uh this podcast ad free for hey, our you, you want to get on on some of that good patreon action yeah like you really do there's some good stuff behind there's some that spicy paywall. stuff some spicy content on there uh <laughs> again bill thank you so much for joining us tonight and we will see everyone next friday uh with mr olson um Bill, any final thoughts before we roll out tonight? No, man. Um, you guys do great work. A lot of heroes on this show. I'm the least of them on the show. Um, I'm pro Second Amendment. <laughs> and um, <laughs> keep it up, guys. Thanks, Bill. We All appreciate right, it, man. Thank we'll you. We'll see you next time. And Thank you, everyone. You're never the least. You're the wind beneath our wings, Bill. <laughs>